Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Today, our guest is a surveillance guy slash blackjack AP that we'll call Jackson. Jackson, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So let's talk first about the surveillance part of your world. How did you get started in uh, surveillance and how long and how high up on the um, totem pole are you? I had just graduated college and I didn't know what I want to do with my life. I had a buddy back home who had worked in surveillance for a couple of years and he was like, hey, you should uh, I can get you a job here. Why don't you come in? You'll probably like it. So I just went ahead and did it. That's how I got in. A lot of people who do surveillance, they'll invite their friends in or they'll hire pretty much anybody. So <laughs> um, you don't need to have a college degree and you definitely uh, don't need to be that smart <laughs> to work in the casino you know, industry. It doesn't pay you very much money. So there's a very high turnover rate. And I've been doing it for about four and a half years now. And are you at the same casino where you started? Yes. I actually, uh, <laughs> I bounced around originally. I actually left, went to another casino, um, did a little bit of blackjack dealing. At one point, I was doing blackjack dealing and working in surveillance at the same time, two different casinos, which I think was unheard of. Um, that was kind of difficult to get approved for a long time, but I managed to do that. And... Now I'm back at the same casino I started at. And of the two, you preferred the surveillance job to the dealing job, even though I yeah, would I think it would have been less money. It's a lot less money. Um, I thought I always wanted to be a dealer once I got into surveillance because I fell in love with table games and craps, especially. But I really hated dealing. It's very monotonous. <laughs> uh, the players will sometimes get mad at you. Um, yeah, I didn't enjoy it at all. But and, it did make more money. And and uh, so can we say, are you in a small, medium, or large casino in East Coast, West Coast, or somewhere in the middle? It's in the Midwest. It's a large casino, the largest in the area. We have a lot of table games, a lot of slot machines. And how high up on the surveillance totem pole at this casino are you? I started bet when I came back, I'm still entry level position. If I would have stayed there, I probably could have been a supervisor or a lead or, or dual rate, but I'm mean, still entry level. I kind of prefer it rather than doing management anyway. It's more fun. And how many people are in the surveillance room at a time? Well, you know, every state is different. You know, I, I've heard that in Vegas, there only needs to be one or two people in the room. Um, when I worked at an Indian casino, I, there only had to be one person in the room at, at all times. At my casino, per the state regulations, you have to have three people in the room at all times. So the four people have to be on duty in order to break, you know, let people go on break and whatnot. I see. So when you are training a new surveillance guy, how much do they learn about detecting advantage play? <laughs> Um, the short answer, virtually nothing. Uh, as you, as you first come in, they want to get you started doing things as quickly as possible. Um, just so that you can pull your own weight. Cause it's always really hard when people quit and then you have to find someone to replace. And typically the training, all of the surveillance training takes about one year two years to be actually pretty proficient at everything. So, and when the average shelf life of a surveillance agent is one to two years, um, the training <laughs> becomes very basic and limited because they need to train a lot of people in a short amount of time and people are always leaving. So it's not very advanced training. Uh, for advantage play, pretty much the only real countermeasure we have is to do what we call face scans. 
And you're basically one person on each shift assigned for that day uh, does face scans. And you're doing a face scan once every hour. Now, whether it's at the beginning of the hour or at the end of the hour or in the middle, anytime you want, it's your choice. You don't, there's no set time in which you have to do it, but you have to do one every hour. And you're just looking in all the pits at everyone's face to see if there's any known APs. And we have a PowerPoint slide that has a giant list of APs. And basically this is organized by most recent people who've been caught somewhere. And it's usually within like a five or six state area. So like all the surrounding states that surround our state, we get uh, hits from them or we look in OSN for any hits, usually in the Midwest. And uh, we add those names and faces to our flood show, if they have a name. Some people are unidentified, but if they always have a name, we put it in there. But how many how many faces are in this slideshow? And and do all the guys actually do it, or is it like, oh yeah, I did my face scan? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. You're supposed to look in the slideshow every single at, at the beginning of your shift if you're doing face scans every day. So. <laughs> and how people many act how many faces um, are in that in that slideshow? Uh, it, it builds up very quickly because as you know, um, especially if you're doing the entire Midwest, there are a lot of advantage players that, that pop up all the time. Yeah. And I would think there'd be hundreds of slides you would have to go through. It is. Um, I, I try to limit, I, cause I actually, I do this myself. I work on this, so I'm responsible for keeping this thing up to date. I usually try to limit it to about 75 slides. Um, because it just becomes too big and I've, I've made this issue before, but it's almost impossible to like try to remember all these faces. Yeah, I would, I would think. And, and so if it's, if the guy hasn't been seen in three months, six months, a year or something, do you take him out of the slideshow at that point? I usually keep him on the list, but I put him in an area that you do not have to review. So the list could be two years of advantage players, but you only have to review to a certain point to where it's within like a six month period. So it seems like you're into this. You're interested in it because you're an advantage player yourself. But to the other guys in the room, do, I mean, do they actually go through it or is it one of those things that they, you know, just sort of breeze through and go, yeah, I did it. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of laziness in surveillance. I am one of the only people that's really passionate about advantage play. I I consider myself to be more an advantage player than a surveillance agent because I don't really enjoy surveillance, <laughs> to be honest, all that much. Um, but yeah, there's a couple people in our department who are really sharp and who really uh, want to catch APs as well, and I try to help them. But for the majority of the time, yeah, most people do not want to learn. They don't like blackjack and they don't like advantage play and they really don't care. And so what ends up happening is uh, actually we'll, we'll have a person on our list who's just been caught. There could have been, there could be a slide of a new person just caught yesterday on the list and they'll be playing at our casino and someone who's doing face scans will miss them because they're just not really caring or paying attention. And, um, you mentioned databases, um, do you contribute to the databases as well as going through them? And, and which databases do you use? We only use OSN for, you're talking about surveillance database that goes across the country. Yeah, or we Griffin. Used, or we used, we used to use Griffin when I first started working there. We used to use Griffin. We don't use Griffin anymore. Um, they, they charge money yeah. for that. So we, <laughs> we're, you know, we're cheap because uh, surveillance Departments don't get a whole lot for their budget, period. Um, so we used to use Biometrica. We no longer use that one anymore. We Now we only use OSN. Did OSN's you, pretty good. When you had Biometrica, did you have the facial recognition software? We've never had facial recognition software. Um, okay. I don't know any property nearby that has facial recognition software. I don't know how good it is or how it works, to be honest. 
Yeah. But we did use we use Biometrica simply for their database of APs. Right, and you would put them into your scans, your daily scans of APs in the area, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Are so, these pictures divided by in groups like say uh, skin tone, you know, white, black, uh, Hispanic, Oriental, something like that, male, female? Um, under 30, under 50 or older, something like that. So if you had a hundred people and you, but you put them in those six or seven categories, it would be much easier to uh, find somebody. Do you do that? Okay. So for the, the list that you have to go through before doing face scans, not, uh, it's not categorized like that. It's just simply who's been caught the most recent. They go on top. So I do it in order by, Dates of when they were last seen at, at, in some place. Um, we have a, actually, we have an extra, uh, you know, slideshow that has those categories. So if you, if you see someone who you don't recognize and you think they're in an AP, you might go through that list and just search. You can search by like, you know, white male adult and look at all the pictures of white males and see if this guy matches any of those photos. So you can also search by, Asian, uh, Hispanic, African American. Can you search by yeah, age? No, that's not a not a thing. Huh. I mean, you could you could type in their date of birth, and I mean, because we we put in their date of birth in that slideshow too. We try to put in as much information as we can get, but sometimes all sometimes a lot of them are unidentified, or maybe you just get a name. Right. So, is there a specific um, threshold where it, it, you automatically have to do, oh, or first of all, do you do tape reviews? And is there some threshold where it automatically, uh, generates, there must be a tape review? Definitely. Um, we call them high action. Uh, anytime, first of all, anytime a player is at a table game, doesn't matter if it's blackjack, could be roulette, could be craps, could be baccarat. The player's at a, a game and they're up five thousand dollars. We get a call from the pit. Pit goes, "Hey, this guy's up five thousand. If he has a player's card, they give us player's card. If he has a you know name, a player's card, that kind of thing. Um, if he doesn't, if he's a refusal, we'll just go, "Hey, he's a refusal. Uh, he says his name's whatever, you know." Which I usually don't even put that information in there because he could, someone yeah. could give any name they wanted to. But then we would log that call get a face shot of that person at that table and then we would try to get up if they're playing blackjack we get bet shots so i don't know how familiar you guys are with surveillance but each table game has a drop down shot of the table usually in hd but it looks straight down at the table so you don't know if someone's betting two hundred dollars in black or five hundred dollars in black you can usually tell that it's multiple chips. You just can't tell how many. So you have to use a camera, on um, you know, at, at an angle to zoom in on their wager to figure. It, call it, we call that a bet shot, so you can see how much they're wagering every round. And we only do that for blackjack, so that you know, when we have to go back and do a review of their evaluation of their play, we know how much they're betting every hand. And do you ever right. review other games besides Blackjack? We have to review every table game. Any any high action call. Um, it, so the next day, so for the end of the gaming day, in other words, the next day, we'll get the high action. If that player who was up yesterday 5000 if he lost money, then we don't get a high action on him. But if for the entire gaming day, he's up 5000 or more, and then he gets put into the high action. If it's a player we already know, like a regular player who's already had multiple reviews, typically we won't do a review on him. If it's a player um, who hasn't been reviewed in a really long time, then they might go, okay, we need to do another review on this guy. When that happens, so now let's say there's two, let's say there's two players total for the game or for that day who needs reviews. For being five, uh, over 5,000 or whatever. Those then get put 
into a list or your, your name, your surveillance agents will be put into a list and then they dish out who does the review. So if I'm next on the list, then I'll get assigned Joe Smith, who won $6,000 playing blackjack. So now I have to do a review on that guy from the previous day. So what I do is I look for that high action phone call log, see if I can get a bet shot on him. It's usually 50-50. Sometimes you will not get good bet shots or any bet shots at all. Um, a lot of people are lazy. Some people don't want <laughs> to. There's a lot of laziness in surveillance. Some people don't want to get bet shots. Some, uh, some Maybe we never get a phone call um, because a table game supervisor messed up and didn't call us for whatever reason. So it's about 50-50 chance if you have bet shots or not. But what I do is I go back to their play, find out what table they were playing at, find out which table they were made the most money at. And, and that's usually done through a player's card. And then I'll go to that table, go to that time, and start reviewing their play. And I'll typically do a handwritten blackjack evaluation. And that basically just means I'm starting a new shoe. I'm counting the cards each round. Okay, the, the next round, the count's going to be plus three. Okay, what's their wager? And I'm also checking for basic strategy. If they make basic strategy errors, then I have to go and look up our illustrious 18 list, which is a very small list. <laughs> it's, it's 18 moves. <laughs> um, I like, I know 90 indices I use from a professional blackjack, a Stanford Wong's book, but at our you know, in our department, we only use illustrious 18. And if it's not on the illustrious 18, then it's considered a wrong move. So <laughs> it, it's a limited thing, but you, you do that and you just go through however many shoes you need. You need a, a bare minimum, three positive counts, three negative counts. And we look at all their bets to see if they're following their bets with the count. That's got to take a long time. That's six shoes. Well... No, no, you only need however many, you don't need six shoes. You need, if, a, if, if you can find a shoe, if you can find a six deck shoe that were the running count, when I, when I say uh, not the true count, but a running count of plus three or higher. Oh, I see. And, okay. and a running count of negative three or lower. So if you can get one, one six deck shoe where it's a negative three, negative four, negative five, and then a plus three, plus four, plus five, then that's it. You don't need any more. And we only go off the running count, which is, in my opinion, really stupid because why would an AP be going off the running count in a six deck shoe? Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. Do you ever, <laughs> but, uh, do you ever, uh, send somebody down to the floor to, to check things out? Any surveillance people ever go down on the floor? I would love to do that. Um, some people recently have started doing that as just a little experiment. Um, wanting to go out on the floor and it, it's not necessarily to look at players, but it's actually to do audits on dealers. Fifty wow. percent of the things that we have to do in surveillance are employee audits. And so a lot of times just as a, a recent experiment, we've been sending people on the floor and they'll just stand there and watch a dealer and do it and do it an audit on them live from the floor. Huh. Um, you mentioned uh, that you use the databases. Do you contribute to the databases? And how do you decide who to who to put in and who not to? Talking about OS10, because that's yeah. the only database we use. We put in everyone who's been uh, identified as a, a positive winning advantage player. Um, ah, okay. Even if they're... <laughs> Even if they're in double deck and they're doing a bet spread of twenty-five dollars to a hundred dollars, we'll put them in there. Um, we don't really catch too many advantage players in six deck. Uh, at least high, high, I want to say high action ones. But um, yeah, if they're a winning player, if we've determined that they're an advantage player, even if they're not making that much money, we'll put them in OSN. We put everybody in OSN. How, so how many APs do you think come through your place in a week, in an average week? The first two years I started working there, we don't only do face scans to catch advantage players, unless they got a threshold amount. But maybe only one advantage player a year would actually win over the threshold amount for a review. 
So wow. put, it, put it in perspective, we maybe catch five to nine advantage players a year through face scans. <laughs> so when I started getting really into advantage play, I just started counting down every person in high limit. Because it's double deck tables, you can count it down really quickly, and really quickly you can tell who's gambling. And it takes a little bit longer to tell who's being an advantage player, but you can tell within five minutes who's just gambling if you count down a double deck table. And when I started getting really into it, I started just counting down everyone, and I'd catch one advantage player per week. And typically these were guys who would only win one to two thousand dollars below the threshold, so they never got reviewed. They never got looked at, and they have never been identified. So when I, you go from an entire department catching eight advantage players per year, now catching one a week, people were very surprised, and they were kind of freaking out initially. Um, what about um, other games? Do you do you uh, identify people advantage players on other games, carnival games, or anything else? Um, no, <laughs> nobody really watches carnival games ever. Uh, I, I personally hate carnival games, just watching them, just watching dealers. Um, we don't, we do do card exposure audit, which means we're, we, we take five, five, ten minutes. We look at, we take a camera that's really far away at a good angle and we look to see if a dealer could be exposing their whole card. In a carnival game such as Mississippi Stud, Ultimate Texas, uh, three card poker. Um, most of the time they're good. I've caught a couple dealers who were actually revealing their whole card. Um, but as for advantage players, we have no idea if an advantage player is actually on that game or what they could be doing to take advantage of it. We don't have charts that say, oh, this is the optimal way to play Texas Hold'em if they know one of the whole cards. So (laughs) how would we go evaluating that if we have no idea how to play those games? So um, what percentage of time does heat come for a player come from somebody in the pit versus somebody in surveillance just picking it up themselves? Um, you're talking about if a table games supervisor or whoever is like, Hey, I think this guy might be counting cards or whatever. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I think Um, this guy might be up to something. For us, it's very rare. I mean, I mean, on our side surveillance, we don't, we don't generally ever look at anyone and say, Oh, Hey, this guy might be counting cards. I'm typically the only person in my department who's like, Oh, Hey, this guy's an advantage player. I need to do a rundown on him. And that could be once a week. It could be once a month. But on average, um, it, on average, it's about once once a week or once every two weeks. But for table games, they, <laughs> I want to say, uh, maybe like maybe once, maybe possibly twice a week, we'll get a table game supervisor who will call and they'll be like, oh, you know, like maybe they say, oh, my dealer said this or, you know, hey, this guy, he's betting like really big and then he's betting really small. He could be a card counter. And I usually, every time I get one of these phone calls, I just kind of laugh to myself. I'm just like, oh, God, here's another one. Um, (laughs) We have a procedure set in place because when we receive these phone calls, we have to take them seriously and we have to do a rundown, which means it's just a basic uh, look at the count real quick. uh, Count down the shoe and just look to see what they're betting. Um, and it's, it, it doesn't take too long, but I choose not to do that because half the time I'm already looking at that person and I can tell within seconds that they're not doing anything. It, yeah. Table games is really bad about, they, they, don't, they don't know anything. I mean, a lot of people in surveillance, they don't know anything either, <laughs> but in table games, it's even worse. They really don't. There's, there's two people in table games in the entire, uh, the entire casino who I actually respect and are very good, very sharp about catching APs, but that's it. What kind of counter detection software is used at your place and how good do you think it is? It's very good software. Um, 
if you think about uh, Norm Wattenberger's Casino Verite, it's kind of like that, except it's for casinos. Um, the software, if anybody is, if you have a card counter who's in high limit playing double deck, and they're altering their wager like crazy to, to throw off surveillance or table games to camouflage their bets, essentially, it's going to pinpoint them no matter what. It's going to catch you. If you get run in the software, there's nothing that you can do to hide what you're doing. And that includes, it even, it has like a 30 page analysis and it even can figure out if you're possibly shuffle tracking, whole carding. I mean, card counting, obviously. I mean, it's, it's top notch software. I trust have, it. Have you ever uh, had the software tell you someone was whole carding? No. Uh, it says, it, it, I've had things say that. So many out of so many hands, it's possible that the player was whole carding, but I've never seen a whole carder, to be honest. I've never caught a whole carder, and I don't know if our our blackjack games, usually it's very, it'd be very difficult to figure out if if you could whole card on it. They just, you know, you know, you don't pull the cards out of a a shuffler like you do on a three card poker game, you're just sliding it out of the shoe. I wouldn't know how they go about doing that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that, but that takes time, right? That is, the, is there a way if, if you're not there, <laughs> um, because you can count somebody down yourself in real time, is there anybody else who can do that or they would have to do it in a tape review, which, might take a day or something, right? All of our people should be able to count real time. I actually don't know how many can actually do it because, like I said earlier, a lot of people don't care about counting cards. They don't like counting cards. Um, I, I, I would think uh, most people, I would think that they would need to pause the tape to count the cards and then write it down. I always do it live because I hate having to take the time to pause the tape, write things down. I just do it live. Um, I know there are, there's a handful of people who can do it live, no doubt, but, um, yeah, it's, it usually, I think people usually pause the tape and then, sorry, what was your other question? <laughs> no, no, that was it. But also it sounds yeah. like the casino you're at, even though it's a big casino, it doesn't sound like they get really big action if, if $5,000 is enough to trigger a review on, um, you know, I mean, there are, there are some casinos where, you know, half the people on the crap table are up $5,000 or whatever. Yeah, um, we have a lot of, bo- we have one of the biggest Baccarat uh, businesses in the area. Um, the, the thing you have to remember, it's not if any one person wins 5000 it's who wins that much and hasn't been evaluated before or in the last six months. So if we have uh, okay. if we have Tim if we have Tim Jones who's there every week winning you know five six thousand dollars or whatever more than that but he's been reviewed recently or in the last six months then we're not going to review him. So typically it's one or two people who we haven't reviewed in a very long time, or people that we've never reviewed at all, and, and that's one or two people per day. Right, and if if the guy is playing baccarat, I mean, what are you going to review anyway, right? He doesn't touch the cards. He doesn't, you know. I hate doing Baccarat reviews so much. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's ridiculous. Our player evaluations are super time consuming. You have to record how many times they bet on player, how many times they bet on banker, how much are they playing, how many times are they winning, how many times are they losing. It's a very extensive and, quite frankly, stupid player eval. Right. And if, right. When, if they win so much money, then we have to count down the whole Baccarat shoe to see if they're betting on side bonuses, which is even more stupid. <laughs> when you were a blackjack dealer, did you know how to count cards at that time? And did you evaluate the players at your table? I learned how to count cards about, I think, six or seven months in, first working in surveillance. I didn't start dealing blackjack until uh about 
a year later. Um, and at that point, I was already very good at counting cards. When I was a blackjack, uh, I, at, at that point, I had already, by the time I started dealing, I had already caught in quite a few APs, and I was getting into blackjack. I wasn't playing it yet, but I was starting to get into, uh, you know, card counting, and uh, I would evaluate the players at my table. And I did catch a few, and I did report them to my supervisor, and they didn't really care. <laughs> and then I, uh, you know, sometimes they would care. There was one time where I caught one that was well known, and they were like, "Oh, good job, you know, here's a, you know, here's a voucher for something." <laughs> the employee kind of dining room, you can go yeah, in twice. Yeah. I think it was more like a raffle ticket to possibly get something. Um, <laughs> and, 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 but then the other times I just be like, okay, thanks. And then I leave, uh, there's very, very little recognition in table games. All they really care about and all they want you to do is push out as many hands per hour as you can push out. And they want you to give good customer service and that's it. Huh? Okay. I'm sure. I got quite a few advantage players by telling my boss about them. At the time, I thought I was doing the right thing. Like, I thought I was being a good, honest employee, but now I am kind of feel differently about it. Well, yeah, I was going to say, if you're out playing, I mean, obviously you wouldn't want any dealer whose table you're sitting at to do that to you, right? Yeah, no, you're right. I wasn't playing at the time. I was only care- I was only doing surveillance and thinking I was doing a good job by catching as many APs as I could. Nowadays, if I ever dealt blackjack again, which I wouldn't, I'd probably be like, oh, hey, cool, you're card counting. Like, you know, like, what's your name? How, how big is your spread? I'd probably relate to him more. So how much do you play currently? My goal this year was to play 500 hours. I was trying to play 10 hours a week, but now the coronavirus has, uh, you know, put that on halt a little bit. Yeah. But I still think I can crush some. I, I want to go back. Once casinos started opening up, I want to play at least 15 hours a week to try to make up some lost time. Before we get into your playing career, we have one more question on your surveillance, and then we're going to do a commercial break, and then we'll get back into your playing career. So on surveillance, when somebody uses a player's card, and so you have information, how is how is that different? Than them not having a player's card. Can you make any extra notes or anything like that? You're talking about if you if I catch an AP who's using a player's card, how does that affect something? I mean, yeah. the players' cards themselves are very detailed. They have, I mean, it has your name, your address, your date of birth. It even has your social security number. I think sometimes. Um, it also tells you your lifetime win loss. It tells you your yearly win loss it tells you your monthly trip win loss it tells you the last 30 days of every single table game or slot machine you played and how much you won extremely detailed information um we don't ever use that info really uh for example uh, if i catch an ap i immediately pull up a table manager program that shows everyone playing in the pits and i can show i can Click on him, be like, okay, this player is playing as a name refusal. He's playing. Here's a description of his play, or I mean, a description of his person. And here's uh, a guy, Joe Smith. Here's his card number. Is he skilled or unskilled? Which I'm not sure how they determine that, but apparently they can. And then you can then look him up from there. And I, I do that just to see if the if the AP is actually using a card or not, because we're not allowed to ask APs for their driver's licenses anymore. <laughs> so if they're not what? using a what you, Wait, what do you mean you're not allowed to ask them for their... Oh, you mean when you're when you're barring them, you mean? When you're backing them off? Correct. We cannot ask an AP for their ID. Why? Well, you're um, one of the only casinos that, uh, <laughs> that has that policy. Well, we also can't back them off. <laughs> oh. We can, we can countermeasure them. We can shuffle the shoe every two hands, or we could uh, we could flat bat them if we wanted to, but we can't ask them to leave, or we can't ask them to stop playing blackjack, and we can't ask them for their ID, um, unless it's, they're doing a case transaction. But if, unless if they're not getting CTR, then they don't have to give ID anyway. So 
if you if they're not using a card, then we're not going to get their name. If right. they're unknown, obviously, if we know who they are, then we already have their name. All right. So we've been talking to Jackson about surveillance. So he's also an AP. We're going to be talking to him more about that after a commercial break. South Point has more than 10,000 gains, returning more than 99%. They did anyway on March 11th. When they reopen, they will have closer to 6,000 games simply because half the machines are shut off. They are expected to open June 4th. We are taping this a week and a half before that. So the opening date could change between now and then, depending on decisions made by the governor. The promotion of the month is called Free Play with a Kicker. Pick up your normal free play Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And if you do, you are eligible for the same amount of free play on Friday or Saturday of the same week. Do this all four weeks and there is a double amount of free play that you can pick up either on Monday or Tuesday, June 29th or 30th. If the casino opens as expected on the 4th of June, then everybody will have missed the first chance to be there on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, which is fine. You still get credit, and you can pick up your free play amount on Friday or Saturday of that week, and you're still eligible for the end of the month. At predicted.org, there is a market where you can place bets on the occurrence of various political events, mostly but not entirely in the United States. Most active markets right now are who going to be uh, the vice president nominee and who will win in various states. Gamblers with an edge listeners receive a one-time offer of a deposit match up to $20 at predicted.org slash promo slash edge. You must play the money through once and cannot withdraw it for 30 days. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the games. An additional membership, the pro membership, is separately sold at $6.95 a month or $49.95 a year. Listeners can play 1,000 hands for free and try it out at videopoker.com slash GWAE. The biggest advantage to this is that it's video poker software that corrects you on both quick quads and ultimate X. All right, we are back with our guest, a surveillance guy and an AP. So now let's talk about players. Uh, when you started being a player, how did you get your bankroll? Did you just save it up or <laughs> some other way? To be honest, when I first started playing, I wasn't even sure if uh, card counting really worked that well. <laughs> it sounds kind of stupid, but um, put it in perspective, I actually had a – there was a 20-year surveillance supervisor who used to work with us, and he actually thought that the house edge in blackjack was 5%. It was like the highest out of any table game. And he didn't think that – he thought that you uh, would break even as a card counter. <laughs> so – um. When I started playing blackjack, I wanted to see if it would actually work or not because I had done so many blackjack evaluations to the point to where I'd see players win every hand when the count was negative and lose every hand when the count was positive. And obviously, it's just a short run deal. But I did so many of these blackjack evals that I would I didn't almost even believe that card counting even worked. Um, I got into it because I wanted to see if it worked and if I could actually do it. I started out with $200, lost it after about a month, gave myself another $200, and then I racked that up to about 1500 over the course of a year, just playing red chips. You know, I think I was going between $5 and $60 on shoe games. Uh, That's amazing you didn't go broke more than no, once with... I I mean, a $60 top bet with a $200 bankroll, that's... <laughs> yeah, uh, 
that's not many bets. No, I, I got really lucky. And I and I, I I knew that my EV was only a, maybe one or two dollars an hour. And I, I knew that I shouldn't have made as much as I did. But uh I mean, I figured it worked. So I <laughs> I did something a little crazy that I uh, probably shouldn't have done. Uh, and, you know, in surveillance, you, you live paycheck to paycheck. You're never going to get rich working in surveillance, uh, especially entry level. So uh, I did something a little crazy. I got a really good deal on a personal loan, and I took out a $9,000 personal loan to gamble with and put in $1,000 of my own money because I knew industry. I, I had read around on the forums and looked online, and it seemed like a lot of guys were like, don't get into card counting unless you have $10,000. Um, <laughs> so that's what I did. And, uh, I, I started playing double deck, which I had never played before. First time, uh, was a little, oh, betting over betting a little bit because I wasn't doing a, a good true count conversion <laughs> on a double deck game when I had primarily only played six deck. <laughs> so I ended up losing about 15% in my first session and that kind of freaked me out a little bit. But, uh, after that, I went back to about break even, and then after that, for three months straight, all I did was win in six deck. I went back to six deck, and all I did was win for three months straight. And after that, I think I, I went on. I actually did go on like a 50 or 60 hour losing streak and gave back about 80 percent. But then after that, I made it all back again, and now I'm I've already doubled my banker. Also, <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. So did you pay back the loan? I, paid or, I, or I, I used you... my winnings and a little bit of savings from surveillance to pay off the loan completely because I didn't want to be in debt. Yeah. So that yeah, was the smart decision. <laughs> yeah, I would say uh, taking out a $10,000 loan when you're a beginning card counter is not a prescription for success for most people. Yeah, I know. It, it was a, probably a bad idea, but... um. <laughs> Uh, after I started having some negative results on double deck, I, it, double deck so much faster, you know, the, the swings come and go so quickly. I, it, it scared me, honestly. Now I feel very comfortable playing double deck, but uh, I, I got pretty lucky on six deck, which is what I was already good at. And um, yeah, it, it's worked out. Yeah. If you have a wife um who would okay you uh, taking out a $9,000 loan to go gamble with, you are a, um, <laughs> you have a rare wife. Hey, you know what though? I got a really good deal on the, it was only 6% interest loan. And, uh, <laughs> oh, okay. my, pay, so, my, payment, my payments were very affordable. I got a pretty good deal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so are you, um, on any of the blackjack, websites do you participate in those or do other people in surveillance go on those sites i'll i'll surf when i was first doing research in a blackjack i was reading a lot online and i was going into forums trying to figure things out because i really didn't know how to be a good advantage player you don't learn how to make money or be a good advantage player when you're in surveillance you simply learn the count and you learn how to do blackjack evals so i'm not i'm uh, right now, I'm not subscribed or in any forums as a member, but I will go sometimes online and look through the forums and look at different topics if I don't already know how to do something. I'll try to do research through the forums. I don't know of any other surveillance person who does that. Like I said, most of the guys, they don't really care about blackjack that much. Or, you know, they, they might go out and count cards, but they just do it red chip players, you know, bring a couple hundred bucks, maybe do it two or three times a year. They're, they're not serious about the game. As a player, have you run into situations where you end up playing at the same table as some AP that you previously run off with that player not knowing that you were the eye behind the eye in the sky? Well, <laughs> none of the players I have played with know that I am the eye in the sky. Um I have met and played with quite a few advantage players, uh, especially at the casino that I mostly camp out at all the time because they are a very forgiving casino. They will let APs play there so long as they're not betting, you know, $500. Uh, so I've met, I've actually met an advantage player that I actually have kind of befriended. I'll, I'll, I've actually talked to him for over an hour off the table and I have backed him off before. 
and I feel like a piece of crap because he's a really nice dude. And now I'm like, man, I even feel kind of bad not telling him what I do for a living because it feels like I'm just lying to him and he's a, he's a good dude. Uh, don't you think he might recognize your voice if he hears the show? Uh, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We'll get around. And we'll get around to that if it uh, if it happens. I mean, worst best case scenario, maybe he just doesn't want to talk to me again. Worst case scenario, maybe he tells the casino I'm a surveillance agent and then it ends up biting me in the butt. <laughs> yeah. Now, what about? Um, about it biting you and I mean, have you had any back offs or barrings and and uh, I mean, you mentioned you're in a state where they can't back you off, but I don't know if you've traveled to other places. Have you ever had gotten any heat at work because of your playing? When I came back to work, I was already playing with my bankroll and I was already getting backed off. And I straight up told my boss, I don't want to come back to work here if you guys are going to have a problem with me counting cards. Counting cards is something I want to do every week, and I want to make more money doing it, and I don't care if I get backed off or caught, but I'm going to keep doing it. And he's like, that's cool. Come back to work. We don't care. And, yeah, I I have been backed off in Vegas. I wish I never went to Vegas. That was the first back off I had. Like a like a beginner noob card counter, I didn't realize, oh, I thought I could go in with a fifteen two hundred dollar spread on double deck and be okay. <laughs> and, and not, uh, fifteen to yeah, two hundred. Well that's how beginner I was. I thought that kind of a spread was acceptable. And not only that, but um I was I went to probably the sweatiest casino I could probably go to, which was T I. And um I didn't realize that Willie Ellison helped train the people there, and uh, they backed me off within seven minutes of being in there. <laughs> you might be able but, to beat you know, that record at the El Cortez. That, you know, that, that's, yeah. what, that's what I've heard, but uh, that PI was really good. I'm, I was very impressed with their table game supervisors. Now, we're in an era now that uh, – Casinos are allowing players to come up to the table wearing a mask. Mm-hmm. Have you played under those conditions, and how do you find it for a card counter? I'm playing right now. I've been playing this whole weekend. Um, it's great. I think I think right now is it's a good time to be an advantage player. The mask is only kind of a side benefit. I'm kind of iffy about the mask, but I, I'll wear one. I mean. If if a casino's sole deterrent is to just look for APs that have been flyered, and you're covering over sixty percent of your face, how are they going to know that you're the guy who just got flyered? And <laughs> I mean, but that that's just kind of obviously if somebody looks at the money, you're going to be done. You know, all they have to do is look at your money and count you down. But I think the real benefit from this whole pandemic is that. The social, di- the social distancing, you know, um, when you get to the table, a five or six player table, and now you can only uh, have two or three people at it, which means for me, my strategy for counting is to uh, just camp the spot all day. So if I'm camping in the middle spot, I have a guaranteed spot on my left and a spot on my right that's going to be empty. And so now I can go from one hand at minimum bets to playing two or three hands when the count gets good. As opposed to, like, well, it's also faster. It means you're getting more hands per hour. That too, yes. You get many more hands per hour as opposed to a full table. Where you might only get 60 hands an hour. Have you ever gotten an AP flyer on yourself? <laughs> I was playing in my hometown one day, uh, and this was, I want to say it was a few months after I got caught uh, in Vegas. Um, <laughs> I was playing on one of their double deck games and using a player's card because I'd always use a player's card there. And I was just trying to, I, I don't play there very often, but I was just trying to play there. And if I lost money, hopefully getting uh, some cash back or, or some uh, free play. And <laughs> I think I played there for two, three hours. I was actually rattling chips the whole time. So I made them think that I lost $400 and I, I didn't. <laughs> So I ended up actually getting some free play back, 
what ended up happening was I played there for, like I said, two, three hours. I left. I went to go to another casino. I'm playing blackjack on at this other casino. I'm at the table. I pull up my phone because I get a text message. I don't, you know, I have my, I usually bring out my phone underneath the table just so I can read my text messages without the dealer seeing. I pull up a text message and it's my face at the casino that I was just at. <laughs> and <laughs> it's from my boss and I, I'm starting to freak out. I'm like, holy crap, is surveillance watching me right now? Do they, are they zooming in on my phone? Cause that's what you can do in surveillance. You can zoom in on people's phones. Are they looking, <laughs> are they looking at me? Am I, uh, Am I screwed here? But no, they just kept letting me play. So uh, how often do you do that when you're in surveillance, zoom in on people's phones to uh, see what they're reading? Not very often. I mean, it, uh, we do it for fun, usually not with like APs, but like, uh, you know, I work overnight. So like, say like uh, three or four o'clock in the morning, you get a lot of meth heads that come in because casinos are open 24 hours. so. That happens if they look like they're a shady individual and you think they might be up to no good and they're busting out their phone. Maybe you'll zoom in just to see what they're doing. Maybe they're trying to make a drug deal. Maybe you can actually get an arrest. So that's always fun. But like we don't I don't usually zoom in on people's phones that much. But I mean, we do it just for fun. Sometimes we actually caught a lady um, in our hotel, an employee uh, at the front desk. She was actually, we, we zoomed in on her phone and she was actually stealing. She was comping rooms for herself and her boyfriend. She ended up getting arrested for that. Yeah, I would think so. I would think there were, uh, there might be privacy issues on that, but that would be for. Uh, yeah, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have to ask that next time when Bob Nersessian's on our show. Uh-huh. <laughs> so Jackson, we thank you very, very much for joining us today. This has been informative. We wish you continued success in your career as an AP and uh, surveillance as long as you want to do it. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So Richard, do we have any recommendeds today? Uh, no, since we taped the show just before this and I already gave my recommendeds then, I, I don't have any more. See how you are. Well, I have that many too. So. Yeah. So. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you, Richard. Go out and hit lots of royal flushes, everybody. Good day. <laughs>